Greetings. <laughs> that was pitiful. <laughs> I said greetings. greetings. Good to be back at Tacoma Park. Thank you, Sister Alberta and the Ham team. Ham was organized, I think my first or second year, her pastor. They organized Ham. And of course, thank you, Pastor, and your staff for sharing your pulpit with me uh, today and for giving Sister Wright and I a chance to come back to a church that we love so very, very much, Tacoma Park Seventh-day Adventist Church. Good to hear the Breath of Life Quartet, the old Wood Fork. Wood Fork was a student worker with me. He graded my papers. That means he had intelligence. <laughs> There's slippage over the years. <laughs> and then Pierre Louis, who I sang in the Odeons under his mother, a uh, gracious and beautiful woman, and uh, he was the Minister of Music at CPC during our growing years. And um, just to see these guys, and I think at my age, I'm 77 now, the, uh, don't let this sue you, it's just for men, just for men. <laughs> see, you're my age, you're comfortable now with that. I don't care what you think. I color my beard. So what? <laughs> you, you get comfortable. You, I, I no longer have any pretense in me. I'm, I'm who I am. I'm what I am. Um, take it or leave it. Just pray for me. Pray for me. So just, it's, just, it's, it's good to be here and to, to share the word. The Lord led me to a passage I've wanted to preach on for years, never, never touched it. But I decided to go there. And so let's reread some of what um, Rita read to us. Go back to Joshua 14, would you? Joshua 14. And I'm going to start back in verse 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, said to them, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me and Kadesh Barnea. Now listen, he's going to give us history. Verse 7, I was 40 years old. How old was he? When Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But holy, I follow the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance, your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord, my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he has said, these 45 years. So he was 40 when the promise was made to him. It's now 45 years later. He's 85. Let's see how much courage we have in this building. If you are 80 or above, stand up. Right now. 
80 or above, stand up. Give them a hand. Give them a hand. Carl, I see you. He's 85 years old. Now listen to him. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years. Ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. Now the next verse blows the mind. Shall I continue? As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. That is, he said at 85, I got the same stuff I had at 40. I wish somebody would just say amen. amen. Let me read that again, because it just sounds so good. As yet, I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then. So now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Verse 12, since I'm 85, and since I have not eased up a bit. Now therefore, whoa, give me this mountain. Y'all too calm for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a statement. 85, and he says, don't shove the easy stuff my way. Give me something that matches my strength. Because though I'm 85, I got the strength of a 40-year-old man, so give me 40-year-old man stuff. Come on, somebody. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, the young folks ain't got the strength of this 85-year-old man. Now, now, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Bow your heads. Lord, bless the sermon. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, let's, 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 let's do a little Bible math. I spent time with Caleb. Name means dog. From the Hebrew word that means a dog that will not let it go. Ooh. According to Joshua 14.7, Caleb was 40 years old when he, along with 11 other men, were sent to spy out the promised land of Canaan. The action of the 12 spies is recorded in detail in Numbers 13. Verse 6 of that chapter names Caleb as one of the men who represented the tribe of Judah. Chapter 14 of Numbers, stay with me, records how the spies returned gave their report. And you will recall that 10 of the spies gave a negative report. Remember that? Negative report. But two spies, Caleb and another spy called Hosea, whom we know as Joshua, gave a courageous and faith-filled report. The 10 men said, look, there are giants in the land, and we were as grasshoppers in our own eyes. Notice, in our own eyes. They saw themselves as inadequate. Not God, not the people of the promised land, but they down, listen to me, they downsized themselves in their own head. You read Caleb's speech in Numbers 13.30. And it was Caleb who spoke, by the way, not Joshua. When that happened, Caleb was 40. How old was he? 
Let's go back to the beginning of Caleb's life. Understand that Caleb had grown up as a slave. Now, if he was 40 when they got to the promised land the first time, and by the way, it took them one year to get to the promised land the first time. So he grew up in Egypt, born a slave, lived in slavery. His toughness was honed in the, in the Jewish ghetto of, of, of Egypt. No, 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 no paved streets, no, 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 no inside plumbing, no, no, no justice in the courts, uh, beaten at a whim by a, a, an Egyptian overlord, no formal education, unfair wages, or no wages at all, having to bow and scrape to his master. This is the way Caleb grew up. He was a dog. He was a tough dog. And there are people sitting here today who, who've come up the rough side of the mountain. Can I get a witness somewhere? It has all, not always been good. You may be driving a Lexus now, but you remember when you didn't have a bicycle. It was tough. And Caleb understood those years, and, 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 and he, he, he knew what it was to have your, your stomach growl, and, 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 and there's no food to answer that call. I can remember evenings when my mother fed me and my brothers, gave us food to eat, and then she would go in the room and, and turn on the music, turn on the radio. She did not eat. I said she did not eat so her sons could eat. She would fix a plate for dad and, and put it in the oven. We knew we shouldn't touch it if you wanted to live till the next morning. <laughs> and, 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 and Caleb knew what it was to have rough times. He, he had no change of clothing. There was there was, there, was, there, was, there was no plumbing, there were, there were candles for lighting, there were no amenities in the home, uh, a simple pallet uh, to sleep on. This was his childhood and youth. This was Caleb. And I want you to listen to Caleb. Was he saying at 85, in spite of all that, I have not, not let life rob me of who I am. And that's what I want to talk about today. Living on planet Earth is a rough life. We live in a land of idiots. Let somebody say amen. amen. You do not know what to expect the next day. This is our Egypt, but we cannot allow, Lord, help me preach today, we cannot allow what this planet is to rob, of, uh, rob us of who we are. God made us to be sons of God and daughters of God. Somebody ought to say amen. And I will not let Tacoma Park, I will not let Washington, D.C., I will not let this planet Rob me of my heritage. I am a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. He had grown up in Egypt, hearing the words quoted by the old head, the elders, the promises of God that he would deliver Israel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all these words have come down to him. And, and for over 300 years, God had not answered those promises. possible that Caleb, like the rest, began to lose his faith. And then there showed up one day, unexpectedly, the escaped prince of Egypt, a man named Moses. And that arrival of Moses changed Caleb. Moses brought promise. Caleb was in his late 30s when Moses came announcing that God had heard the cry of the people and commanded Pharaoh to let the people go. Caleb, like the rest of the Israelites, had much to learn about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was a God of wondrous power and uh, had control of nature. And as the ten plagues fell, uh, they, they saw, and, and by the way, each, each plague of Egypt was against a God of Egypt. And, 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 and the plagues proved that the gods of Egypt had no power against the God of Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, and so Caleb gradually became a believer. Remember how the Lord brought you to where you are. There was a time when you didn't have enough sense to believe, but now you do believe. Remember how God gently brought you with events in your life. Don't let loose of those moments when God demonstrated that you were special to him. Don't let life rob you of that. There, there, 
everybody sitting here, here who is an adult, you, you, you have some moment in your life where God has said, you are special. I care for you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? When God separates you from the crowd and, and something happens in your life that's distinct and unique and special, and you know in that moment, God knows who you are. It's a wonderful feeling. When over one million people were marched out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery, Caleb was there. Think about it. The crossing of the Red Sea, Caleb was there. Think about it. He joined a million of his relatives as they sang the song of Moses. After the water slowed back to their base and covered the armies of Pharaoh, the water from the rock, Caleb drank the water from the rock. Come on, somebody. He ate manna for 40 years. Caleb, Caleb, the majestic presence of God at Mount Sinai. Caleb was there when they received the Ten Commandments. We're told, don't touch the mountain. Caleb witnessed all this, and over the 40 years and wandering, Caleb began to realize there is a God. You know, I'm going through some things now, and and and... And I, and I rise every morning and I find myself saying, thank you, God. God performs miracles in my life every day. Every day. He shows me that he's real, that he's there, that he can do, that he has answers, that he has power. Every day. Don't let those moments slip by. Just get up out of your bed of sorrow and recognize that you got out of your bed. That's proof that God's there. The wages of sin are death. Every day you live, you are a miracle. When they were, when they were sentenced to wander the wilderness for 40 years, Caleb could have been upset. After all, he was one of those who gave the good report. Why should he be punished with the rest? But he suffered with them. The first year of the Exodus for the Jews was one of trial and growth. Within three months, they arrived at Mount Sinai. Caleb was there when the Ten Commandments were given. He was there when the instructions of the tabernacle were given. They spent six months building the tabernacle. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. And then they traveled another three months and finally arrived at the Jordan River, the Promised Land. That's when the spies went out. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. It took them one year to get to the promised land. It took them 40 years to get in the promised land. Here's the unpleasant part of the sermon. When God first called you to him, he wanted to give you everything right then. But you weren't ready to receive it. Let me say that again. When God first called you to him, he wanted to give you everything right then. But God has found out that folks have to wander for a while before they're ready to come to the promised land. And here's the beauty of it. While in the promise, while, while, while in the wilderness, he's a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Even though you may be wandering yet in your wilderness, God is still there with you. Come on now. Don't complain about the wilderness. You weren't ready for the promised land. We're now in the wilderness. We ain't ready yet, but one day, hey, one day we shall walk on the streets of gold. We got to do wilderness work now. He's working on you. He's stripping you of everything you think is special. So in the promised land, comes, you'll be ready to receive it. That's why those of us who are going to live through the time of trouble, and I do believe I'm one of those people. I really do. I got time of trouble genes in me. (laughs) 
I'm just a stiff old piece of wet leather. You just can't, I'm that kind of person. I, I want to go through the time of trouble. And, and the Lord is saying, before you get to glory, I got to take you through the time of trouble and take everything from you, Henry Wright. So by the time you get to the promised land, you are ready to receive it. Let me tell you a story I've told you before, but I'm old. Old preachers, old preachers can do that. You can't do that yet, Nixon. You have to tell new stories. I can tell old stories because they say, well, he don't remember he told that story before. But I, I, I'm, I'm, driving, I'm driving up 29 to the union office where I was working in my Pontiac S.T.E. But it was old. Windshield wiper on the drive, a rider's side didn't work. Air conditioning, Frank, did not work. But you know, pride is a terrible thing. And it's July in Washington, D.C. area, moving toward August. It's hot. And I drive up to the light before they had cleared all the lights off the 29. And a guy in a Mercedes, X-Z-E-F-T-I-A-A-A. -A -A. <laughs> you know, I don't know, I don't know how they do that to us. Nobody wants to own a car that doesn't have a Z on it, or an X. He's got his windows rolled up, got his coat off, his air conditioning is working, Mine is not. And so this dumb Negro, not wanting him to know, Ron, that his air conditioning does not work in his STE, I roll up my windows <laughs> at the light. It was one of those three-minute lights. And I'm sitting there, determined, praying for that light to turn. Because I'm melting in that seat. And all of a sudden, I'm talking about why you got to go through the wilderness to get you ready. The Holy Spirit whispers to me and says, I'm going to burn his Mercedes up. Let down your window, swoon. Are you listening to me? And so the Lord in these last days is going to take from us all those things that we have attached and made so important so we'll appreciate the promised land when we get there. And so now we're living in the wilderness. Let's talk about Caleb's life at this point. First of all, we learn, listen to me carefully, The circumstances of your life are God's chisel. We were talking in the Sabbath school class today, and uh, a good class, good class, really appreciated the class. We were talking about the fact that the Lord has to teach us dependence. See, Joe, the Lord now has put me in a situation where Henry Wright has no answers. I'm a fixer. I think that if I'm in a situation, I can fix it by the grace of God. I have great confidence in my ability to do that. But he's placed me in a situation now where I have no answers. And I've had to accept the fact for the first time in my life that maybe I have not learned to lean on the Lord as much as I ought. 77 years old, retired pastor of 53 years experience. But you see, listen to me, and I thank him. See, circumstances are God's chisel. And he's now putting the finishing touches on Henry Monroe Wright. Come on, somebody. He's working with me. 
He's determined to make me totally dependent and trusting on him. You have no answers for this, Henry. All you have is a heart that can reach toward heaven and say, God, help me to get through this day. And I can testify, help comes every day. So whatever your circumstances are, they're God's chisel. He's readying you. And if the circumstance is rough, it's because God knows you need the roughness. If there's no answer, it's because he knows you need not to have an answer. Are you listening to me? Caleb's life was his chisel. You got cancer? Chisel. Been through divorce? Chisel. You got crazy kids that got your craziness? Chisel. Somebody say amen. If you have low finances, chisel. If you have people who don't like you that you work for, chisel. God, he, see, there is no coincidence with believers. Everything is planned and thought out by God, and so he lets it happen because he knows you need that pruning to be ready for the kingdom of God. So learn, that's why the song says, thank him, thank him for, thank him for the trust, and mean it. Thank you, Lord. I've said it on my knees in the morning with tears streaming down my face. Thank you, Jesus. I do not know what to do. I'm not preaching today for your entertainment. I'm preaching from my heart. I always thought I believed in the Lord. Now, I believe in the Lord. So he's not done with you yet. Lesson one from Caleb, circumstances are God's chisel. Second, no matter what your circumstances are, you can learn. So you've never learned up. You've never caught up. Uh, life has no PhD. There is no terminal degree in life. As long as you're living, you're learning. And so in his years in the wilderness, he's still learning. As a slave, still learning. Those first five years they got in the promised land, still learning. God is always teaching you why. Because the one thing Hear me, hear me. The one thing you ain't never figured out yet is God. Has it ever occurred to you why the Bible begins with the simple phrase, in the beginning, God? That is the essential truth of life. And you spend all your life trying to understand the first text in the Bible. And once you grasp it, <laughs> who God is, his might, his majesty, his awesomeness, his planning, his skill, his undeterred love. Once you get that, you can be saved. I say to young preachers, be humble. Be humble, Chris. Where is Chris? I love Chris. Boy, can preach. Where's Chris Cheatham? Going downstairs? Okay. I said to young preachers, tell Chris, he didn't, take my, he didn't take my class. You're humbled by the fact that you spend your life preaching a subject you can never understand. So number two from Caleb, you're always learning. Number three, Caleb, could have become extremely bitter over the 40 years. Remember, he believed God when they first got to Canaan. He was ready to take the land. Uh, Numbers 13, 31 through 33. Put that on the screen for me real quick. Put that up there. Read, come on. 
But the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Keep on. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land to which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. Read on. There we saw the Anakins, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, so we were in their sight. But Caleb took on the we part. He was a part of those who said, no, we can take the land. But he owned with the Israelites the failure. Stay with me. We never hear Caleb judging his brethren. I'll say it again, you didn't get it. In the church, we must learn that we are we. See, it's not she is an adulteress. We are sinners. See, it's not he is on dope. We are all high. See, you can't even say amen. So you, 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 you don't want to like this part of the sermon. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the members of the church to own everybody's sin. It's us. It's we. We have no time for judgment or looking down. We all have fallen short of the coming. And so, and so there should be no split in the pews. Those who are faithful and those who are not. Those who keep the Sabbath faithfully and those who not. Those who return tithe and those... And t listen, li listen, listen. We are the family of God and the nose is not better than the feet. Feet stink, but the nose smells defeat. And so Caleb walked with his brothers as a fellow sinner with them. And 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 these 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 two men. I mean, I mean, Josh. By, by the time we get to our story, there's only two old men in the camp: Joshua and Caleb. And yet he took on. He took on the faults of his brothers. Fourth, we learn from Caleb the blessing of self-assessment. Joshua gets mentioned in the Bible 237 times. But Larry, Caleb only gets mentioned 28 times. But at the moment of crisis, it was Caleb who spoke out and calmed the people, not Joshua. He was never made a general, never made an elder. And when Joshua was looking for an assistant, he didn't call on Caleb. See, the last lesson from Caleb that I learned is that it's important in life to have an honest self-assessment. You've been a member of Tacoma Park Church for years. They've never asked you to do anything important. You're not in the choir, but you can't sing. They've never asked you to be a deacon or an elder. Glory to God when you become so attached to the church and to Jesus that you don't have to be anything but a member in order to be faithful. We need to have an honest self-assessment. And many people spend their whole life thinking of themselves things that nobody will ever think of them. Did you, did you hear that sentence? I worked on it. It's right here in the notes. I worked on it. The only 
important thing in life is what God thinks of me. Give God glory. Give God glory. Give God glory. And by the time Caleb was 85, you would think he would be at least standing up there with the elders. You know what your problem is? You're so concerned about what other people think of you, you've never accepted what God thinks of you. I am somebody because one blood from his, drop of blood from his veins was for me. That makes me worthwhile. I don't need your praise. I don't need your adulation. I don't need an office. I don't need a title. I just want to belong to Jesus Christ. So when Christ has come, I'm okay. See, some people think that crisis develops character. Crisis reveals character. When you were born, God had a plan. It was his plan. And you're not finished until he's finished with you. I'll tell you one thing that Caleb accomplished. He set feet on the promised land. Even Moses didn't do that. Well, let's draw it to a close. He's 85. He left Egypt around age 40. Got to the promised land finally around age 80. What's he been doing for those five years? Well, Joshua chapters 6 through 11, they were conquering the land. Joshua chapter 2, they lose Moses. Caleb was with that group that marched around the city of Jericho. His name is not called. He remembers the Achan fiasco. They got beat because Achan had stolen from Ai. He remembers how they got tricked by the Gibeonites. He was there. He's just a part of the group. He was there in Joshua 10 when the sun stood still. I wonder where Caleb was standing on the front line. And then by the end of chapter 11, the Bible says the land had rest. You would think, after all this, conquering and fighting and slavery, Caleb would be ready to get some rest. See, that, that was my picture of retirement. Rest. See, you have, you have to say the word right. You don't say rest. Rest. <laughs> Picture of rest. It never occurred to me that the greatest challenge of my life would come after I retired. Never crossed my mind, hardly. You fought the battles, you have stood in the test, you have chaired the board meetings, you have rebuilt churches, and you have done this and baptized us. Time for rest, God! No, 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 no! I'm still chiseling you, Henry. I've held one last thing for you. You got to go through it. And I'm trying, by the grace of God, Adam, to get the spirit of Caleb. Because the land is being crossed out now, and there's the plains and the cities and the, 
and, 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 the, and the easy places, and, and somebody says, well, we got a plot of land over there in the Hebron, that, but, but there, there are giants there. there the Anakims are there, and they've dug into the caves. We cannot get them out. Caleb said, what, what did you say? Excuse me, what, what, what did you say about the Anakims and the, and the hills and, and the caves? Yes, yes, Caleb, that's over there. Well, well, ha, ha, whoo, give me that mountain. Give me that challenge. Give me that rough place. But, but Caleb, you're 85. That don't mean nothing. I just, I just had a physical. My blood pressure's fine. My heart's fine. My lungs work. My eyesight is good. My hearing is strong. My joints are, star, are straight and strong. I don't need a blue pill to take care of business. Yeah, I'm ready. Come on, Caleb. Give these young bucks those planes. Give these young place people those easy, but give me, hey, give me the mountain. I'll take the mountain. Somebody give Caleb a hand out there. Glory, hallelujah. You ain't never got no rest. I know, I know, sorry, sorry, you'll catch up with some of you, will catch up with that later on. You'll never, ever reach the point as long as you're alive where God will not test and try you. I got it now, Frank. It's clear. As long as there's breath in my body, God has the right to work me over, has the right to toss rough stuff my way. In fact, he kept me alive this long, 77, because it's hard to say they hit me right. You can't say, you can't kill him at 17. He ain't ready. You can't take him out at 47. He's got too much sin. You got to wear him out, stretch him out. It's going to take a little time. My dad died at 101. That goes to show you how much patience God has. Dad was something else. I'm 70, so he's still working on me. Hallelujah. Give me this mountain. I'm still climbing. Oh, that's my subject. I didn't give it to him. I'm still climbing. There's another old man I need to talk about before I close. He's called the Ancient of Days. Everything we've been through, he's been through with us. He's called the Son of Man and the Son of God. And his people have mourned him out over the years. They say they won't but they do. They say they will, but they don't. They have worn Jesus out. And so he decided to come here because there was one more mountain that needed to be conquered. And he dressed up in human clothes, old as he was, and became a man of 33 years, though he was older than you can count. Because there was a mountain that had to be climbed. It was full of the Anakims, the giants, Cecil, of our sins, the giants of our weakness. The giants had dug in this mountain. They, they owned it, they possessed it. It, 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 it had to be conquered. And, not just anybody could take it. It was, it was, it was a mountain called Calvary. Yes. And the mountain was so scary that he said to his father, if it be possible, I don't want to climb this mountain, but the father did not answer. And finally, Jesus, with the courage of a Caleb, said, not my will, Lord, but thine be done. If Calvary must be conquered, if Golgotha must be climbed, then Jesus declared, Give me this mountain. Crawled on that cross. Conquered my fears. Conquered the giants of my ugliness. Crawled into the caves of my dirty thoughts. And cleaned them out. Thank God for Jesus who in the spirit of Caleb declared, 
for Henry Wright's sake, give me this mountain. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. I love that old cross. Give me this mountain. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Sing with him. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for home folk we're not there yet we're almost the Lord is going to come a lot sooner than some of you think in the meantime there's some folk here who've got some mountains you got to climb am I right about it Caleb was able to choose his mountain. You will not be so lucky. The mountain will be shoved at you. And the Holy Spirit rolls and will say, climb. And your response must be, Lord, by your grace, I will take the mountain. Are you with me? So somebody here has been wavering at the height of the hill. It looks almost impossible. I remember the mountain you were calling when you came and took that center. It was in bad shape. I earned a lot of respect for you said, Lord, give me this mountain. And by the grace of God, you and the people have turned that sin around. God bless you, my friend. You're not a young man when you said yes to that. What about you? What are you facing? What are you facing? See my good friend Granville sitting there We've had some similar mountains, haven't we? What about you? Can you trust God to climb the mountain? We talked on our class today about dependence, didn't we? And one of the things we learned in class today was this. Listen to me, folks. Being a Christian is not how strong you are. Being a Christian is how good you are at recognizing your weakness. Did you hear what I just said? Being a Christian is not how strong you are, it's how honest you are to, to at recognizing your weakness. Because that gives you dependence. See, read his words. He said, if the Lord say so, 
Didn't he say it? I'll take the mountain if the Lord say so. He did not go in his own strength. I just want you to join me today if you've got a mountain. Come up here, let's pray. Come on, wherever you are. And don't come unless you feel like it. Next course, Anwar, as they're coming. Oh, that old oh, rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. Come on, let's together. Uh, Raleigh, God bless you, boy. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll change. come are not here with us. I understand. We know that you're here. Because there's not a person in this room who's an adult who doesn't have a mountain to climb. I know that. I don't have to ask. You read the rest of Caleb's story. He cleared out the Anakims. He took them rascals out. There wasn't a cave left with an Anakim in it. They were giants, by the way. That's how your problems look to you. Giant. That's the work of the devil. Pastor's going to pray for us now, just to have courage and strength. Maybe somebody's giant is a decision to make for Jesus. And Pastor, keep that in mind as you pray. Maybe somebody's mountain is just saying yes to Jesus. Hold somebody's hand. The pastor's going to pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we stand here today recognizing that there is a mountain still yet to climb. And each one of us has one, and we have come to the front today standing at the foot of the cross saying, God, we know right now in this moment that we don't have the strength to climb that mountain. Yet you've told us that we have to. But glory be to God that the word of God says that when we come to Jesus and lay our burdens at his feet, even if we're not strong enough, Jesus himself will put us on his own back and climb the mountain for us. Mm. Father, we claim that promise today, recognizing that we don't have the strength. And I wish we could say we knew beforehand we didn't have the strength, but we find out as we try to do things in our own strength and fall on our faces. That's how we know. We've tried to do it without you already. And now we're coming saying, we know we can't do it on our own. We surrender to you today, asking God that you would take control. So Father, there are many mountains out there. We each have a hill to climb. And you know what it is that we need your help in. And for somebody today, it is giving their lives completely over to you. So I'm asking God right now in the silence of this moment that you would make somebody make that right decision today. Amen. They would give their life to you. They would live for you from this day forward, never turning back to their old way, but only following you until you come. Lord, I want to thank you for the man of God who delivered the word today, Pastor Henry Wright, and I'm asking God that you would bless him with the blessing that he stands in need of. Bless his wife as well. 
Thank you for their ministry. Thank you for what they've done. Thank you that you have used them and that you are still using them today. 77 years old, and he's still as strong as he was when he was in his 40s. <laughs> Praise God for that. <laughs> God, thank you for the life that you have given to him and the breath and the way that you have used him today to remind us that we're all still climbing mm, yes. and that when Jesus comes, we can take that last ultimate climb to glory Amen. knowing that you are coming for us. Amen. Lord, we know when you come, we can have the courage to say, Lord, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Bring that day soon in the glorious name of Jesus. Let everyone who loves God say together, Amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated.